There is no one left in the towns. You can see the stands here are filled for both Harbor Beach and Beale City. Derek Puff, this young man is the balance that they need. Troy Schelke, T-R-O-Y, Schelke, S-C-H-E-L-K-E, teacher and coach here at Harbor Beach High School. And here's more of it. Puff. Another first down. Derek is one of the toughest, hard-nosed players uh, I've ever coached. The lower half of his leg, uh, very much less muscle than the other one. But he basically uh, you know, played on one leg his whole career and gained 1,000 yards his senior year. So just incredible. When your lower leg's like that, you're going to have problems in the hips. And so I'm sure there's plenty of games where, uh, you know, he went out there and just gutted it out and, and wasn't feeling great. And, and as I said, he wasn't just an average player. He was a fantastic player, 1,000-yard rusher on the state championship team. Yeah, just a, you know, that real competitive fire that no matter what obstacle is out there, he's able to overcome it. And he's able to put in the work uh, to do that and then able to bring other people along with him. So real, a real leader. Small communities come together. When tragedy happens, everybody bands together. And here on county, it's second to none. I feel like Harbor Beach is community. We help each other out. We all look out for each other. Since he could walk, I'd take him hunting out in the woods, you know, and he's always been, uh, you know, a go-getter, very determined person, funny, just, I mean, it's, 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 ever since he could talk, just uh, kind of a little smart aleck, but it, just great personality, everyone liked him. I, I mean, he was my best friend um, ever since we were little. I mean, he was always one step behind me, right in my shadow. I remember waking up every Saturday morning. They used to have like a local circuit around here. We'd get up at six in the morning, dad would take us out. We used to jump our bikes. He, I think he broke the same collarbone three times before he was like 10. Yeah, you know, he's my bigger brother, but he's, you know, big brother, little brother. We, we, we fought, you know, verbally, physically. He, he, <laughs> he was always better than me and always made me upset. And uh, it wasn't uncommon for me to call mom at work because he was picking <laughs> on me. And no, we got along, we didn't, you know, but he was, it was definitely, a, I don't know if it was like a dominance thing or what it was, but uh, yeah, he definitely picked on me a lot. <laughs> Made, made me the man I am today, I guess we can say. <laughs> Gave me a little bit of a backbone. I thought all three of my older brothers were just awesome. I always looked up to them when they were out jumping on the dirt bike track or what. I was always on my little bike looking up to him, being like, I can't wait to be like them. But I always looked up to Derek. He was, I think he was definitely the hardest on me when I was growing up. I beg to differ on that one. Back to differ on that one, okay. But, There's no way of that. No, but when, when he was always outside doing something, I always looked at him and was like, man, I just want to be like him. I just thought he was the coolest dude ever. Well, I've coached other sports besides golf, and um, I would have to say that there was probably nobody that worked harder than he did. I'm Joe Twilliger, J-O-E-T-E-R-W-I-L-L-E-G-A-R. -E -E I teach uh, math and science in high school. Oh man, he, he was a hoot. He was, that's an old timey expression, he was a hoot. But uh, no, he always had a good sense of humor. Uh, he was always a good friend to everybody. He always wanted to know why something worked or he wanted to figure it out. Like if I would go to him and he needed help, he wouldn't want me just giving the answer. He'd want to know how I got there. He's just a popular kid everybody likes. I mean, he's the all-American boy, he really, really is. I could, I could tell something was bothering him. So, you know, his classes were a little bit tougher and he was pushing himself more. I was starting to worry about, you know, gosh, he's really putting a lot of pressure on himself just to maintain a 4.0, right? And then um, spring break came and then he, he came home.
It was around 1.30 in the morning and um, just went in and uh, was gonna you know, check on Derek and I opened up his room and he wasn't in his bed. And that, that striked me really strange. And so I came flying down the stairs and said to my husband, have you seen Derek? And he's like, no. We, we couldn't find him. We, we, had, we, we did not know where, where he was, what happened. So um, I, I was running through the house and scrambling and, and my husband went outside and I heard this loudest scream that I have ever, ever heard in my life. And my husband just started yelling and screaming, no, Derek, no, no. Yeah, that night I got up to go to work about two in the morning and uh, we knew he was not in the house and then they came out and right here, that's where he laid. That's right, right here. And I uh, yelled into Lisa, the wife, I said, don't come out here. I found him and I said, I called 911 and you know, I didn't know where to take him in. And that was a miracle right from the get go to, uh, I threw him in the back of the pickup and uh, I found out later from the paramedic that good thing Jerry knew what he was doing. If I laid him on his back, he would drown in his blood to two miles to get uptown even. Watching Jerry pull him and putting him in a vehicle to, to get him up to the hospital, I called 911 and just started yelling in the phone for, for no reason. I just didn't know what to do. I was completely lost. I, I, I truly believed Derek was going to die that night. and. I called my mom and dad and my dad. I told them to please go get Father Bill. I, I wanted Derek to have a last, you know, a final blessing and his last rites. And and uh, Father Father Bill came up and Father Bill was the only one allowed to be with him. He was knocking at the door and I and he kept knocking and I was in the bedroom, of course. And I said, okay, I'll be there, I'll be there. And he kept knocking, you know, wanted to make sure I heard, I heard him. And, uh, and then I opened the door I, oh, and then I saw who it was and I, recognized him and, and then he told me about his grandson being down at the hospital and wanted me to come down there. And so I, I went in to see him and, uh, and I prayed for him and gave him the anointing of the sick. After 20 years, you don't remember every day anymore, but there are some that you never forget. And that was certainly the one I will never forget most of all. This is a bit graphic. Uh, it, it startled even me, and I'd been a surgeon in, in the ER for a while. Uh, when I looked down and looked under, his hair was hanging over his face, and when I looked at his face, there was no face. There were sh just shards of skin hanging down. And really, from the, the base of his uh, orbit on top, uh, down to his mandible, was bit, his chin um, was basically gone. I noticed that he was still breathing, so I took the wheelchair and went down to the trauma bay, and the nurse grabbed his feet and I grabbed the rest of him, and pulled him up and over the arm of the wheelchair and onto the gurney. And at that point I watched him and he was no longer breathing. When someone stops breathing, you put a mask on their face and you do what we call bag them. You force the air in through the bag through a mask. Well, with Derek, of course, you couldn't do that because there was nothing in which to create a seal. I was at the head of the bed and I stopped for a moment and I just said a little prayer and said, please, you know, take my hands. And if, if this young man is supposed to live, take my hands and make this happen because I'd never intubated a patient where I had no landmarks by which to navigate. And I knew in that moment, I have no doubt that for me, that's God. And God took my hands and that went in first pass with no problem. And I just knew that that young man was supposed to live and we had just gotten some really big intervention. And uh, so then, then you can attach to the tube and start to bag. And sure enough, his lungs filled up, his heart started, his blood, everything started to happen from there. And I thought, wow, uh, there's no doubt in my mind, this young man's meant to make it. As I was wheeling down, I asked a nurse to call Life Flight and they weren't flying, which happens fairly frequently um, out at Harbor Beach because of the heavy winds and snows and 
decreased visibility. So there was no ability to lift, airlift Derek out, which means a long ambulance ride uh, down country roads in the winter, um, some serious stuff. So I also knew that we had to get him stabilized enough to be able to manage that ride. And we need to have some prayer <laughs> for Derek to be able to survive that transport. A nurse had to volunteer for that transport. And boy, what a scary thing, right? But they did it. And the nurse that had to transport Derek had to hold the tube steady for that entire bumpy ride in the back of an ambulance because there, were no, there was nothing on which to secure it properly. Everyone was really shaken by this. And um, one of the officers went out to the house with a garbage bag and shoveled up a lot of the snow where Derek had bled because he didn't want his parents to come home and see the blood in the snow. And I thought, wow. You know, what empathy this meant. He didn't have to do that. That wasn't part of his job. He did it because it was the right thing to do. And he wanted to decrease the pain of these parents in his community. One of the things that's really remarkable to me when I think about that night or that early morning was how the community all came together to give Derek the best shot he had. It was the dad scooping him up and, and getting there as fast as he could. It was that beautiful nurse who went out in a cold Michigan morning with a wheelchair. It was the nurse that, that every person in that emergency room that helped resuscitate him. It was Father Bill communicating with the family. It was the ambulance driver going like mad. It was the police to allow the trip to go quickly and then dig up the snow to prevent some heartache. It was the nurse who held the tube through an entire ride to make sure that Derek received oxygen. So I've watched a community really become a cohesive unit to help this young man. The first time we actually saw Derek was when he was transferred to Flint Hurley. You know, everyone, everyone started crying. I started crying and, you know, I'm gonna lose my brother. You know, I'm gonna lose my big brother. He's, you know, he's gonna die. So I was just told. And um, mom grabbed us and she said, you wanna go say your goodbye? And uh, we said, yeah. And she's, she said, it's really bad. Like it's winter out, you know, it was in March. She said, put your winter hat over your head. I don't want you to seem like this. So I remember me and you both put our, our hats over our eyes and we held mom's hand and she walked us to the room. And uh, she put my hand on one of Derek's hands and yours on the other. And we both said our goodbyes. And you know, I, I remember I lifted my head up, my head up, cause you know, just curious. And then I saw him there and it's just, just like an overwhelming feeling, just seeing something like that. Like the most, like the most gruesome horror film you could ever imagine. Like we, we yeah. saw it right there. And it's different when it's your brother, you know what I mean? I remember walking in with my hat on, you know, already crying and stuff. And I peeked too. And then I just, I don't know, yeah. I just, the anger came over. I kind of started yelling like, Derek, why'd you do this? It's like killing a part of your heart because your children are your heart. And um, seeing him laying there, nothing, there was nothing I could do for him. And I, uh, I was just broke. I was just completely broke. Just asking God to take him to heaven, to I, I just take him to heaven and be with him and to give strength to our family, help us figure out how we're going to get through this day to day, minute to minute. They uh, made the decision. You know, we went, we said our goodbyes. Um, they flight carry him to Henry Ford because that's where organ donors take place. Apparently, that doesn't happen in Flint, so they flight carry him down to Henry Ford so he can be an organ donor. And uh, the next morning, went back down to the hospital, and they were trying to get uh, Derek to recognize voice or to move, and he's not doing anything. And I remember my sister yelling, "Derek, Michael, move, move your foot!" And he moved his foot. Kenneth Moquin, M O Q U I N. I'm a senior staff plastic surgeon and general surgeon through Henry Ford Health System here in Detroit, uh, but also in the surrounding communities. He wasn't in good condition. Um, Derek had a very serious problem, um, both to the eye and also what the eye couldn't see. In other words, he was damaged on the inside and the outside. 
Um, fortunately, he was treated by very good people out in the field and they were able to secure his airway and keep him alive and, and get him to our institution. And so once I took a look at him uh, in the intensive care unit and reviewed some of his tests and all that, I had a very brief discussion with his parents to introduce myself and, and the team and all. And I would like to plant the seeds at that point in time that we're not entirely sure what path we're going to be taking yet, but we're going to figure it out. And I said, if the path is a path to being able to rebuild things one day for him, that path is going to be a very long one. There are uh, family members who cannot, for a number of reasons, sometimes even look at someone, let alone interact with them, hold their hand, even if their hand isn't injured, speak to them, eventually maybe help feed them, care for them at home, care for them at, at a hospital. And then there are people who take a deep breath and say, we're gonna do what we have to do. And I think initially, uh, Lisa was someone who, rightfully so, was utterly traumatized. I mean, she was devastated. And, and so much so that she was, she was almost paralyzed in terms of her personality. And I didn't know Lisa until a number of days that Derek was here when I think he was in the intensive care unit and some of the bandages covering almost his entire face, either partly or wholly, fell off to the side and Lisa accidentally saw things. And, and that was very traumatic for her. But that was, I think, a turning point that I saw in her where she then was the other type of person where she took a deep breath. And ever since, through all these years, she has been his caregiver. She has been his advocate. She was his mom. I wouldn't expect anything different. Derek's a comedian. He cracks jokes constantly and many times he won't try to be funny, he's testing the waters. And he's really notorious for this in the pre-op area and the post-op area with the nurses and the anesthetists, where he sees them enough, he knows some of the buttons that he can press, and he'll tease them about sports, he'll tease them about personalities, he'll tease them uh, about just daily goings on in their life. And so he really became an integral part of Henry Ford Hospital. <laughs> Absolutely, he was a football player. He gave me this tie for one of my uh, birthdays. This is his initials and his number from football. Um, I saw some of the pictures from before the accident where he's an avid football player, a pretty good one. Nurses on the floor will come up to me on their way home, walking out to the parking lot saying, I haven't seen Derek in a while. What's going on with him? What's, when's the, what's the next step? Our scars make us who we are Now I'm ten feet tall over my demons Remind me no one's got me like myself Yeah, I love me without any help I'm the best thing to believe in My name is Dr. Rizal Johan. I'm a plastic surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic. And we're actually part of the team uh, that is successfully performed the first U.S. face transplant more than a decade ago. This is going to be our fourth one in the Cleveland Clinic. And we have the opportunity to meet uh, with Derek. And Derek is a very, very special individual. What are the components that are missing? We're missing the nose, we're missing the cheekbone, we're missing the heart palate, part of the mandible. So all of those things are the crucial map. So when you're trying to build a house, what is the foundation? How you built from the ground up? So the bony structures are the foundation, the basement going up toward, up to build the nose and how to get the nerve together, uh, the vessels together. The vessels are the plumbing. The nerve is the electricity. 
So in like building a house, you build from the foundation ground up all the way up, including the inside and the muscles, everything's into like the fine tuning, how we can actually make it work together at the end. Face transplantation is a collaboration between the patient and the team. The team of not only the surgeons, but also the whole treating team in terms of the rehab, the psychosocial, and, um, but most importantly is his willingness to go through with this as well as the support system around him. Support system from the family, support system from the community. I think that is quite important because right now, perhaps he may be a little bit more shy to go out to the community because of injury, but what we have learned from the past, from our previous patients that they are more comfortable, they gain such confidence uh, into the relationship, into society. Because that's how we interact with the society, is through our face. Not only how we present ourselves in the community, but also how we express ourselves. Certainly, I was very, very um, pleasantly surprised about his spirit and also the support uh, from his family and the mother and the father who are actually really wants to make sure he can get back to on track what he has been missing. So we were very, very um, enthusiastic about the future uh, outcome or what we can potentially help for him. Knowing that he sustained a very massive injury and he has gone through in the last seven years, that he continued to have a very, very high spirit if there exists an ideal person for a face transplant in 2021, it is Derek, hands down. He dedicated himself to the program that we set up for him, which included stretching, cardio, which we built up on the treadmill, um, just went from steady state walking to hill intervals, and now he's actually jogging. He's done strength programs, you know, his strengthening, he's, he's improved every week. He's so resilient, he pushes through, you know, there's been a few days he doesn't feel good, he's still here, and he's, his positive attitude, he's just incredibly positive. So, um, he, like I said, he inspires me, he's always positive when he walks in, has a smile on his face, and he's ready to, just ready to do whatever I throw at him. The first miracle in itself was Jerry putting him face down. If he, if he would have put him face up, he would have choked to death on his blood. I mean, his face was completely gone. So that, that was the first miracle in itself, was getting him, getting him to the hospital, because he, he never should have made it to the hospital. God is very much present um, in our lives in different ways. And we are alive today for a reason. And every single day is an opportunity that God has given us to show His presence in our life by what we do, how we use our lives. Our lives are, are only meaningful if we use it for others, help others, assist others, not just for ourselves. I knew when I stopped and asked that prayer, please just take my hands, please. This is, I don't know, this is more than I've ever done before. I know for sure that I was blessed with some intervention that I really needed. Derek's first longest surgery out of the 58 was 26 hours long. I, w I was just alone and lost and kept praying and a gentleman from the maintenance crew who had been walking you know, back and forth through the night cleaning came up and he said, uh, I see you have a, a deep faith. And I said, I, I do. I said, he lived for a reason and I truly believe God is at his side and God is with him now. I said, I, I, I know that. And he said, can I, can I say a prayer with you? And he, uh, he sat with me and we, we said a prayer together. And um, I was so thankful and grateful for just the, um, the peace that you know, he brought me and he had recently lost his son in a car accident. And he said, you know, um, the strength of God will get you through this. 
I was so blessed to have him there and um, we really we really never saw him again and it was just he was there that night and um, he was just like a, a you know a, an angel to me you know he was just an angel to me his name was Joe He loved pizza. You know, I just want to get back to the day where, you know, we're back to normal here and you can, I can have a slice of pizza with him. You know, I'm really looking forward to that. So hopefully one day soon. There's no doubt in my mind, you know, when this is done, he's going to tell his story to save lives. How many people will this young man touch and help? And I'm grateful because even in that very first moment, he made my faith stronger. And that's affected the rest of my life. I think. A face transplant would be not a path to happiness, but I think it would elevate the happiness and allow him probably to touch more people about his story in life with, as a, compared to without the face transplant. And I know it's you know, in him that you know, great things are going to come from him. And great things can be changing one person's decision in life. Thank you everyone who is healthy. Lord, here I am today without them. Family, friends, just everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you. For a moment, Derek felt like life wasn't worth living. Since that moment, he has fought to live every day. He's fought to live and get better through 58 surgeries. A life shouldn't be defined by one mistake. Derek's story didn't end that night. I think Derek's new story began that night.